Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Prescription, the Tax Policy Center's bi-weekly webcast on fiscal policy. This is one of a series of conversations with state, local, and federal government officials, as well as leading economists and other experts. I'm your host today, John Buell. I'm a senior communications manager at TPC and a contributor to our blog, Tax Talks. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. Uh, we encourage audience members to submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. This event's being recorded and we'll be posting on our website, uh, taxpolicycenter.org in the near future. We're also using uh, captioning, which you can adjust and turn off at the bottom of your screen uh, using uh, the live transcript button. If you'd like to join the conversation on social media, you can please use the hashtag live at urban. And if you have a suggestion for a future guest or anything else regarding the prescription, you can feel free to email us at info at taxpolicycenter.org. So my guest today is Dr. Valerie Wilson. She is the director of the Economic Policy Institute's program on race, ethnicity, and the economy, where she's a nationally recognized source for expert reports and policy analyses on the economic condition of America's people of color. We'll be talking about the tax proposals under consideration right now in Congress, which aim in part to help reduce the longstanding racial economic inequities in this country. Before joining API, Dr. Wilson was an economist and vice president of research at the National Urban League Washington Bureau, where she was responsible for planning and directing the Bureau's research agenda. Uh, she also has a PhD in economics from the University of North Carolina Chapel, <laughs> North Carolina Chapel Hill. Dr. Valerie Wilson, welcome to the prescription. Thank you, John. Glad to be here. Yeah, well, we're glad to have you. This is a very timely discussion. Um, as you know, not long after taking office, the Biden admin really kind of put a new spotlight on how tax and budget policies could help address some of these uh, economic racial imbalances that, uh, that I know you've studied and that we've seen growing over the years. Um, so from your perspective, um, leading up to when the president put out his budget, uh, how have you seen these conversations evolve, evolve in recent years? And uh, what are you hoping to see now that the White House is involved? Yeah, so you know, I think the fact that there are longstanding uh, racially stratified social and economic structures in this country speaks to the fact that racial justice and racial equity in terms of our uh, fiscal and tax policy making um, have not been as much of a priority as they should have been in prior years. Uh, I think it's important that we acknowledge that all policy uh, in this country shapes how our nation's income and wealth will flow. And as a result of that, uh, who has access to opportunities? Uh, so the existence of these racial inequities that again are entrenched and longstanding uh, means that any policy that's under consideration will have implications for racial equity. By considering the needs and centering the needs of those uh, who are the most economically vulnerable, I think we are able to make policy more effective and at the same time, narrow those gaps. So centering racial justice in our policy making is really just good policy. And again, it's unfortunate that we haven't had as much focus on that up to this point, but it is refreshing to see that the Biden administration has decided to take this on. They're marketing uh, his budget plan as one uh, that advances equity and using a strategy to really focus on many of the inequities that were uncovered by the pandemic, including inequities in health, uh, education, and economic opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you know, the negotiations right now are happening fast and furious. Um, the House Ways and Means put out a plan that makes some, you know, pretty decent sized changes to what the White House had put out. But uh, safe to say, though, that uh, Democratic lawmakers are certainly going to look to raise taxes on high income households and corporations, and they're going to do some enhanced tax breaks for families and lower income households. Um, extending some of what we've seen during the pandemic. Um, so that seems to be pretty much the main goals that I don't think are going to change too much. Um, so just talking about the specific policies you've seen so far, uh, what's your assessment on how these plans might really start to help some of the racial inequality issues? So I think, you know, on the side of, of where we're going to increase taxes, uh, I think that's an, an important uh, point and, and something that's important for folks to understand that those efforts alone uh, will have uh, some implications just because of how income and wealth are distributed. Uh, there's a significant uh, income, uh, racial income gap and a significant uh, racial wealth gap that means that we will be uh, increasing taxes on wealthier households, which are disproportionately uh, white households. 
And then at the other end, a number of the tax breaks and, and tax cuts uh, that the administration is focused on getting to working families in particular will flow uh, disproportionately to more households of color. So those two things are, you know, ideally going to narrow uh, some of the disparities that we observe. And in fact, it you know, becomes necessary to uh, collect more taxes from wealthier households in order to do a number of the things uh, that we'd like to see happen to you know, help provide greater assistance to low and moderate income households. I'm thinking uh, specifically about some of the investments uh, that the administration wants to make in terms of improving uh, infrastructure, uh, both in terms of transportation, and, and, and uh, physical uh, building structures in communities of color and modernizing and, and, and retrofitting many of those. Uh, affordable housing is a priority uh, that is long overdue and being addressed. And then some of the areas of expanding access to universal preschool, the idea of um, increasing the Pell Grant, the, the funding that has been proposed for investments in HBCUs, uh, tribal colleges, Hispanic serving institutions uh, are all investments in our future, uh, as well as things that can help address some of these entrenched racial disparities in economic and social outcomes. Yeah, and you touched on one of my follow-up questions, which I think is important. Your answer is probably just going to be both, but I'd be curious. Um, so as you know, the taxes, taxes can address this gap in two ways. It can either put in place policies that boost after-tax income of households with less wealth and income, or it can actually reduce after-tax income of higher income households and so raise more revenue for the programs like you're talking about. So in some ways, I guess this comes down to which part of this scale do you think has been neglected longer or worse off? Um, but is there any one that you see as more important right now or do you think they're both equally important? I think both are equally important uh, because you know they are companions. If we want to, you know, I think we, we have to be honest about this. If we want to spend more money on things, that's going to require money. Uh, we can either, you know, make those expenditures through uh, deficit spending, but we can also uh, expand uh, our, our uh, revenue by collecting more taxes from those who uh, pay less than their fair share. So I think both of those things are important priorities, uh, both, you know, not only in, in a functional uh, matter of, of getting things done, but also in terms of the message that it sends in terms of fairness and equity and justice uh, in general. Right, um, now going back to uh, taxes and inequality, um, a lot of the immediate discussion talks about income inequality, which is important, but there's also wealth inequality, which I know you studied and you understand that there are some different ways to address these two different issues, but the wealth inequality gap between white and uh, black and Hispanic households is also very eye-catching. Um, so how do we need to be talking about these two different issues when talking about tax reform? What do policymakers need to understand as far as, you know, you can, Put a certain tax policy in place, but you know the, the goal might not be the same. Yeah, you know I think that it, it becomes uh, imperative that we are clear about what the goal and objective is. Um, we can address income inequality, and I think that probably is an easier <laughs> solution to get to. Uh, but addressing wealth inequality is uh, something entirely different. Uh, first of all, because the income gap, which currently is about uh, 60%, the typical median black household has about 60% of the income of a typical white household. But when we look at the wealth gap, we're talking about uh, more like a, a 10 to one disparity between black and white households on wealth. And in fact, even when we look at black and white households with similar wealth or the same level of wealth, we still see a huge uh, wealth disparity. When we compare households uh, with similar or the same levels of education, black and white, there's a huge wealth gap. When we look at <laughs> same employment status, same occupation, there's a big wealth gap. So the wealth gap is a much more uh, entrenched uh, inequity and, and probably one that it is, is a, has greater significance in terms of a household's uh, long-term 
or overall uh, economic uh, viability simply because wealth is an important backstop uh, against a loss of income or employment. And so those are two different objectives and goals. And I think it's clear that in our, I mean, we make clear in our policy making which one of those we are, in, we are going to address. I think most of the, the policies and proposals are, that are out there are probably going to do more in the near term for income inequality than they will for wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, none of this is easy, um, even as we're seeing right now, um, you know, the plans are changing, because at the end of the day, you're trying to make the tax code go from helping a set of incumbents to trying to provide different benefits for a different constituency. And so the people who benefited are, are, are going to feel concerned about that, regardless. But um, for now, we're just talking about wealthy households, um, however you define that, and corporations. And, you know, polling will typically suggest you know, your average American is fine with that, with them paying higher taxes. But there's also other issues that build into, especially the wealth gap, uh, tax breaks for retirement benefits, 529 plans for college savings, the home mortgage interest deduction. Uh, you know, these widen the wealth gap for sure. And they've been around, you know, some of these policies for decades. But some of the taxpayers that benefit, they don't, they don't feel wealthy. They don't feel like they're at an advantage. Um, so I guess as far as the next step of the discussions, um, you know, how do we make addressing wealth inequality, um, how, how do we advance that discussion beyond just the ultra wealthy and help people understand how some of these, how some of these policies have really made the problem worse and, and how we can best fix it? Yeah, and you know, I think that the, the challenge in that really comes in understanding, again, getting back to the point of what we mean by equity and how we want to address the wealth gap. Um, you know, with the ultimate goal being to minimize, uh, if not eliminate, uh, racial disparities and economic outcomes, uh, I think it's important that we um, get back to this idea that no policy is race neutral. Uh, again, we can ask ourselves, why don't we see equal benefit from things like the mortgage deduction, the 529 of uh, plans, uh, uh, retirement uh, benefits. And so if we are to do something in the name of equity, putting these sorts of programs on the table for consideration, and, and by consideration, that means you know discontinuing them. Then on the other hand, we also need to start doing something else. I think it's more than a matter of saying, you know, we have these kinds of programs that we spend a lot of money on uh, and they have unequal benefits. So we should stop doing that. But that does not address the broader issue of the wealth gap uh, that is, it has been in existence for generations because wealth itself is something that has the capacity of passing from generation to generation. So even in discontinuing uh, programs that provide an unequal benefit, it does not eliminate the uh, longstanding and, and currently existing wealth gap if we don't at the same time take steps to address that directly. So, you know, I think it's a matter of, again, not just discontinuing something that has yielded unequal outcomes, but then starting to do something else that helps to narrow uh, those disparities that have been entrenched across generations. Right. Um, and I'm sure another, an argument that you've heard or, and had to address before, um, some people might push back on some of these ideas, particularly the tax increases and say, well, you know, if the, if the economy isn't expanding, no one's going to really benefit or be able to see an increase in their income. It's going to make it difficult for anyone to accumulate wealth. Um, but you've done some research about uh, how the economic expansions we've seen in recent years necessarily benefited Black and Hispanic households, particularly those in poverty, the same way as white households. Um, so when people push back on you when they talk about, well, we need to have growth if any of this is going to happen, um, you know, talk about the more inclusive growth that you think is important and how we can get there so that we stop seeing, even when the economy is booming, just a continuation of, of the status quo. Yeah, and I think that, you know, gets to, again, thinking about uh, the way that we design policy in a more comprehensive manner. Uh, you know, there are a number of things that are important to making sure that there's broadly shared uh, growth and, and, and economic prosperity 
I think the foundation of that, since the majority of households in this country get income through working, is making sure that we have a, a robust uh, uh, labor market, that employment <laughs> remains low, uh, you know, to the extent that we're able to, to manage that. Um, and then beyond that, it, it gets to addressing uh, why we see disproportionate outcomes. There's a two to one unemployment rate disparity. So even when we have a, a strong economy and a, a strong job market, there's still a two to one disparity in unemployment between black and black workers and white workers. And that disparity is observed at every level of education. Then there's also a wage disparity uh, that we observe. So even among workers who are employed, there are disparities in pay. All of these things are important to the bigger picture because economic growth in this country is driven you know, largely by consumption. What individuals, what the income of households and the capacity of individuals um, to you know, use that income uh, to meet their needs and at the same time, uh, helping to generate economic growth in this country. And so what happens in terms of the labor market, which is my primary uh, area of focus and study, uh, has huge implications in terms of the, the broader uh, health of our economy and why we see disparate outcomes that then sort of overflow into things like disparities in poverty, disparities in income, disparities in wealth. The labor market also has implications for who uh, has capacity to benefit from a lot of the uh, 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 tax uh, programs, things like access to retirement benefits, who has savings, who's able to purchase a home and actually get a mortgage deduction. You know, all of that is connected to household resources that include both their income and savings. And a lot of that is connected uh, to one's ability to maintain and sustain uh, uh, employment. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so mostly we've been focusing on federal policy and there's a huge role to play for, for Congress and for the president. But um, also, I mean, having studied state tax policy for a long time, I can tell you that racial equity has really only been added to the state and local tax policy discussions just very recently as well. Um, and as you know, state tax codes are, are much more regressive. Uh, local property taxes, you know, people could spend hours discussing how the, the, those systems are skewed in the wrong places and benefit older existing homeowners. Um, but, um, you know, beyond the national level, I guess, you know, what have you been seeing or hearing about at the state and local level? And uh, talk generally about what we need to see there, because, you know, the feds have an important role to play, but, you know, state and locals have some control over this, too. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And, and you've probably spent more time looking at, at state and local tax policy uh, than I have. But I think that's an especially important issue because uh, we tend to see that states and cities uh, rely more heavily on the kinds of taxes that are more regressive. You mentioned property taxes, uh, but consumption taxes as well are a huge part of that, uh, regress the regressive nature of those taxes. And, and by regressive, you know, we are referring to the fact that a larger share of one's income is spent on taxes. That's in part because of, of again, the pre-existing uh, racial income disparities that we observe across communities. Uh, but also uh, on the issue of property taxes, um, there have been studies recently that you know, have found that even when we're looking at black and white ho uh, homeowners um, whose properties are of comparable uh, value or characteristics, uh, and in the same tax district, there is a higher tax assessment on Black homeowners than white homeowners. So that, you know, there are a number of ways that these things get entrenched uh, in state and local policy even. And in order to uh, address equity more broadly as a nation, we can't neglect uh, those things. Uh, I think you know there's a lot of, of great work being done uh, in this area to identify those specific taxes uh, that are not only regressive taxes, but also uh, are, are racially inequitable. Uh, a lot of that work uh, has been done by ITEP uh, and they've put out a number of recommendations 
uh, in a recent report uh, about specific targets in, in state and local policy for making uh, our tax systems more equitable. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now, uh, and again, you know, as, as an economist, you're the perfect person to ask this kind of question about. So, you know, the tax code can do a fair amount to uh, direct benefits to one place or another, but it can have its limits too. And so we've seen an interesting experiment, um, you know, besides the fact that the aid that we saw put out during the depth of uh, the pandemic uh, was unprecedented just in its size and by most accounts very effective, if not even though it wasn't perfect. Um, but we've also seen, you know, economic impact payments, so direct cash assistance, and also taking the child tax credit and turning it into a monthly stipend, um, you know, w which is a pretty big deal. It's not something that we've we've really done before that I'm aware of. Um, so I was wondering if you could just talk about, you know, as far as efficiency of providing benefits, the idea of using the tax code, uh, earned income tax credit, or even the child tax credit, even if it, as it's been modified, um, versus just cash assistance and, and what policymakers need to think about with some of the trade-offs there. So it, the Census Bureau released their 2020 income and poverty data this week. And according to that report, the top three poverty reducing programs in 2020 provided cash benefits. Uh, Social Security, obviously, is at the top of that list. Uh, reducing, uh, keeping about 30 million people out of poverty. The economic impact payments were second, uh, keeping 11.7 .7 million out of poverty and unemployment insurance was third at five and a half million people kept out of poverty. Uh, refundable tax credits came in fourth at 5.3 million people uh, kept out of poverty by that. Now, to be fair, uh, you know, all of that reflects the scope of eligibility for those various programs and how much is spent in each program. But I tend to think that putting cash in people's hands is just much more a much more effective method of providing needed assistance than, than credits. Uh, the changes to the child tax credit have been a good thing. They provided a larger credit, uh, expanded eligibility, uh, for older children and the, the monthly uh, payment structure, I think is critical for getting people the assistance they need when they need it, which is on a month to month basis to help meet their needs. But at least for now, that even those changes to improve that program have are temporary. And even with that, they're still facing challenges with take up among eligible households who have not been tax filers. Um, I think the challenge with using tax policy in general uh, also lies in the fact that it's conditioned on a, a family having earnings or having enough earnings that would require them to file a tax return. And going back to what I was mentioning earlier about the persistent two to one black white unemployment disparities uh, and uh, racial and gender disparities in pay. I think that lends to that being a more problematic way of equitably providing assistance. But it's a balancing act. Um, we think about also, you know, whether or not we're going to de design programs that are, are universal versus means testing. Universal programs, I think, help to encourage broader support because more people uh, see themselves as benefiting from the program, but it also risks uh, unnecessary expenditures or expenditures on, on people in households that don't necessarily need that assistance. On the other hand, you know, means testing is helpful for doing something that is more targeted, uh, but that can also represent a burden uh, to the households who are eligible, uh, especially when the burden of, of proving or justifying eligibility falls on them. And so, you know, it's really a, a mixed bag and a, and a balancing act. But on a whole, I tend to think that providing cash assistance is a more direct and efficient way of providing the assistance that people need. Yeah, and you talked about means testing versus universality and uh, how much of that also just tied to, I mean, we've also st we've started to see some data on, you know, the recent pandemic because so much cash assistance was put out there. And as it turns out, a lot of people did use this to, to pay their bills or take care of debt they owed. And so um, do you, 
are you hopeful that maybe the the concern that you know if you give people money they'll just use it on stuff they don't need and all that you are you are you hopeful that we're going to start to maybe you know eat away at some of those preconceived notions about how a universal program can work i hope so and you know i i think a lot of the attention that gets paid to things like that is it, based on you know, individual or isolated outlier uh, events. Uh, the evidence, you know, really is clear that when you provide uh, cash assistance uh, to low-income households in particular, they're more likely to spend that money on the things that they need because that is the immediate demand. Uh, I think by and large, people are not foregoing uh, meeting their needs, providing food, keeping a roof over their heads to buy some luxury <laughs> item. And so, you know, I think a lot of those claims have been uh, overblown and really used uh, as a, a political tool uh, to sway uh, support for those kinds of programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, I could talk your ear off about TAMP and a lot of other programs that have probably suffered because of that. Um, but since we only have so much time, we can discuss these issues uh, today. Um, lastly, I wanted to go over some of the public polling perceptions um, that I've seen shared in um, the past few months. Um, and so there's been, an, there, there, there have been um, data experts, polling experts noticing that, you know, when you talk about expanded benefits, um, you know, you get a certain level of polling support from people. And it actually starts, it can start to drop a little bit when you go away from the general goals of say, the child tax credit or some kind of basic cash assistance more generally to when you start talking about disadvantaged, you know, communities, whether it's black households, Hispanic households, um, you know, what can economists do to address this perception? And, uh, you know, like, what have your thoughts been when you when you've seen this kind of data as far as, you know, what might be behind it or what the issue might be? Yeah. You know, I, I think that that kind of response is really uh, a symptom of our history with race and the usage of racist ideology to uh, distinguish who's deserving of something versus who's not deserving. Uh, I think we have also, uh, or those, that sort of framing also tends to muddy the water uh, in terms of our recognition of who is actually <laughs> receiving help. Um, you know, again, a lot of this often becomes a part of our uh, political uh, back and forth and, and you know, differences between uh, the two major political parties in this country. But, you know, an image comes to mind when we hear the word disadvantage. And for most people, it's not an image of an elephant or a donkey. It's of a person and more uh, often than not a person of color. We, you know, have been talking here today about inequalities in the tax code and advantages that are made available to corporations uh, and wealthier households, uh, benefits that accrue more to white households than in uh, Black or Latino households. And there's less critical evaluation uh, of deservingness in those instances than we see for some of the, the programs that are targeted more to what you know, we label as disadvantaged uh, households. So, you know, that's a, a, a factor and just a part of the reality of living in this country, given the, the legacy of, of race in this country. But as economists, I think it's important uh, that we continue to do uh, all that we can to be as clear about where the benefits actually accrue, who is receiving help and how much. And that you know, includes all of the kinds of expenditures that are available in this country, uh, making it clear that uh, the mortgage tax deduction uh, uh, other kinds of, of, of tax benefits that favor income uh, derived from wealth versus income that people derive from work are also ways that we provide help and assistance uh, to people. And that you know expenditures on those kinds of things uh, perhaps do less to uh, uh, be stimulative to the economy than the kinds of assistance that people 
who need that money to spend on necessities uh, would generate. Um, and so it, it's important that we are clear and that we uh, keep the record straight in terms of what the actual economic impact and benefit of all of those things can be. Absolutely. All right. Well, I very much appreciate it. I mean, you tried to squeeze into 30 minutes, something that could take hours and hours or days if we wanted to. So very important issue. And it'll be interesting to see what Congress ends up coming up with. But thank you for your time. And thank you to our to our guests and viewers for watching. Thank you.